Well, I could talk for a long time about what China watching in Hong Kong was like before we could go to China. It was, it was really very exciting and uh, very challenging. And you know, we did a lot of interviewing of refugees. And what's so interesting is how well a lot of that research held up just as uh, research with Soviet refugees held up once things opened up in the Soviet Union. I think about that now with North Korea. Um, actually, uh, the institute I direct just hosted uh, 12 North Korean economic officials here in the United States uh, for two weeks on an educational study visit and I traveled around with them just as I used to travel around with national committee groups. And uh, I really actually learned so much about China from accompanying those groups here because it was a great opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and they would be quite relaxed in what they would tell you. And I can tell you they were a lot more relaxed than the North Koreans <laughs> I spent two weeks with. Um, but uh, let's hope the next group of North Koreans is a little more relaxed. Um, the topic that I'm speaking about tonight is the commercialization of the mass media and the uh, introduction of the internet in China and how they are changing Chinese political life. I think that the Sometimes I like to talk about this as the information revolution in China because uh, there really has been such a dramatic expansion of the amount of information that people have access to in China today. And I think it's actually one of the most dramatic stories of political change in China because there are many ways in which, the, of course, China's economy and society have been dramatically changed over the last 35 years by the introduction of market reforms and opening. On the political side, we sometimes contrast that with the, and say that political change has not been nearly as extensive as what we've seen in the economy. But when we talk about information, I think it really has been revolutionary. Now, um, of course, China is far from having a free press. And um, censorship remains very extensive and uh, controls over content. And when you read in our Western media about the Chinese media and the internet, the main theme of everything you read is about how extensive censorship is and how tough the controls are. But there's another side of the story and I'd really like to emphasize that side this evening, although I'm sure we'll also talk about censorship and Jasmine Revolution and what's been happening in China recently. But, you know, uh, when I compare the amount of information that people are able to access in China today and compare it to the time that Jan and I were living in Hong Kong and that I first went to China, you know, the story then is that the very top leaders in China, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and others, they actually had quite a lot of information from internal publications, including translations from the foreign media. But ordinary citizens had almost no information about what was going on in their own country or what was going on outside of China and they had to rely entirely on rumors. So you had this huge information gap between what leaders knew and what ordinary citizens knew. Today that information gap between elites and masses has drastically narrowed. Now of course in democracies like our own, you might say there's almost no information gap 
I mean, I remember when I served in government, everybody had CNN on their TV sets in their offices because they would get breaking news about breaking events first from television, not from some internal sources. So basically, elites and masses knew pretty much the same thing. And I can tell you that classified information was pretty useless um, in terms of learning about China. I had hoped one of my greatest motivations for going into the government was maybe I'll finally understand how Chinese politics work. But it didn't uh, turn out to be the case. So in any case, the narrowing of this information gap between elites and ordinary citizens has dramatically changed the strategic interaction between leaders and citizens. And that's a lot of what this edited book is about. Now one theme that runs through the book, not just my essays, but those of the Chinese journalists and scholars as well, is the profound ambivalence that China's leaders have uh, toward the media. The politicians at the top of the Chinese Communist Party are of two minds about whether or not the commercialized media and the internet are good or bad from the standpoint of Communist Party rule. So either they're ambivalent or there are two groups. And I'll get back to this um, in a few minutes. But on the one hand, the leaders certainly are afraid of the free flow of information. They're worried that the free flow of information could undercut public support for Communist Party rule by revealing serious problems at the top or by helping coordinate large-scale mass protests against the government. But on the other hand, Chinese leaders recognize the benefits that they gain from the media and the internet. Um, and they have encouraged the commercialization of the media and the growth of the internet by their own policies. By choosing to give up some degree of control over what people are uh, learning, give up some degree of control over the media and allowing media to compete for audiences, the Chinese rulers are basically making a trade-off. They gain the benefit of economic development. Of course, the market operates more efficiently when people have better information. But they're also gambling that they will reap political benefits as well. By, because by relinquishing some degree of control over the media, they're setting off a dynamic that results in the improvement of the government's performance. And ultimately, they hope, in strengthening public support for the government. So let's talk about how the commercial media and the internet have actually improved government performance in China. Well, first of all, it, include, it improves government uh, responsiveness by providing more accurate information regarding the preferences of the public to the policy makers. So public opinion, now remember these are folks, they don't have elections to give them information about what people care about and want. So, and they don't entirely trust their internal reporting methods. So having the commercial media, commercial newspapers and magazines, having the internet seems like a more direct way of finding out what people really think and what they care about. So public opinion has become uh, a very important factor in the policy process. And the leadership has become very responsive, you might even say hyper-responsive, to public opinion because they're so nervous about whether or not people really support them. And they're worried 
that at some point um, they're worried, especially after 1989, Tiananmen, uh, demonstrations in more than 130 cities throughout China, in the fall of the communist governments and the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, you know, they're worried that their own days of power are numbered. <coughs> they're trying to prolong their time in power, so they are watching what the public thinks very, very closely. So their extreme nervousness about the public's view of them and their policies makes them highly responsive when the media reports on a problem. Um, and uh, the pressure to react is much stronger than when they only got that information through those private internal channels. Because once the media publicizes an issue so that everyone is aware of it and everyone knows that the leaders are also aware of it, then it becomes common knowledge and the government cannot dare ignore it. Um, most recently there was an interesting story about a local government official who actually confessed to bribery on his microblog on his way to the Chinese Communist Party Central Discipline Commission, local in Anhui province, which I thought was a fascinating ploy because what he was doing was making the facts public. He, of course, he also managed to mobilize public support for what he was doing because nobody, as far as we know, had ever confessed on Weibo before. Um, but what he also was doing was making this common knowledge so that the other officials who were part of this bribery story could not escape and the Central Discipline Commission couldn't just suppress it. They would have to do something about it because it had become common knowledge. Um, so this responsiveness to public opinion, and I think if you ask many people in China, they would say that the central government is very responsive. Um, and in fact, the chapters in our book highlight some cases and some issues in which the government, I would say, is too responsive to public opinion. <coughs> One is in the area of criminal justice, as Jerry Cohen and other Chinese law uh, experts have noted, and this is the main argument of the piece by Ben Lieben of Columbia Law School in, in the book. Um, the judicial system is struggling to um, create some autonomous authority to handle cases because the internet public is basically lusting for blood. They want tough sentences um, against people they feel are guilty. And they don't care about due process. They just, if, if they hear a dramatic story, they say, you know, kill the guy. There's a, a case right now of um, a man who actually uh, um, uh, hit a woman on a kind of hit and run. The woman came to try to get the information about his license plate and this sort of thing. And he just killed her. And this case is now in the courts. Uh, there's uh, on the internet, it's, it's been spread around that he is a rich kid from a military family. And so the public is saying, Yao Jashi must die. And this kind of violent mob justice, sort of online lynch mobs, if you will, is making it very difficult for the Chinese legal system because it's in the crossfires of the political pressure from the party 
and the pressure from public opinion. And actually, in this case, the court said that public opinion would be a factor in their decision, which is, of course, not exactly what we would like to hear. So um, uh, another area in which you see hyper-responsiveness to public opinion because of the media and the internet is in foreign policy. Uh, in the chapter that I, one of the chapters I wrote in this book, I talk about how the foreign policy makers are <coughs> pressured by online public opinion and by publications like Global Times to take a tough stance, especially on hot button issues like policies toward Japan. Um, now, sometimes Chinese foreign policy takes tough stands when it doesn't have anything to do with public opinion. But on certain hot button issues, the, uh, uh, the public, mobilized by the media and the internet, is critical of the government for being too soft in the face of foreign pressure, especially when it comes to Japan. And China's leaders are very aware that the previous two dynasties, the Qing Dynasty and the Republic the government, both fell to national movements in which specific domestic discontents were fused together by this powerful force of anti-foreign nationalism. So um, uh, they're very, very sensitive to that kind of criticism and uh, it leads them to change their policy. We saw this in the case of Tibet and Xinjiang. And one of the chapters I want to add to China Fragile Superpower will deal with those cases. Because before the violent protests in 2008 and 2009 in Tibet and Xinjiang, those issues were not really all that salient to ordinary folks in China. Uh, they care a lot more about Japan, about Taiwan, than they cared about Tibet and Xinjiang. But when photographs and video from the violent attacks by Tibetans and by Uyghurs in Xinjiang on Han people living in Tibet and Xinjiang were circulated online, the public was angry. They were not just angry at the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, they were angry at their own government for not defending the Han Chinese in those regions um, staunchly enough. And so they started criticizing the Beijing government for their failures to provide adequate security in those areas. And you can see the result very clearly. Beijing toughened its position on Tibet and then a year later on Xinjiang. They started demarching the European and the American governments to support their position. What, and they started calling them core interests, which they hadn't previously. Um, and they introduced Tibet and Xinjiang into their bilateral um, uh, diplomacy with the Europeans and with the Americans in ways that they never had done before. And this was the direct result, it's just so obvious, that it was the mobilization of public opinion through the commercial media and the internet that drove that change in Chinese foreign policy. Another uh, way in which the media and the internet have uh, affected Chinese governance is that it is helping Beijing get local officials to carry out central policies. One persistent challenge that uh, the national leaders always face is how to get provincial officials, municipal officials, 
How to get the, the local officials to carry out central policies. The leaders of China's 33 provinces are appointed by the party center in Beijing. And yet the central leaders are continually frustrated by their inability to get regional officials to follow their direction, to follow their orders. In a vibrant market economy such as China has today, the old top-down bureaucratic methods of monitoring local officials are no longer working. And of course, corruption at local levels is also rampant. So national leaders are relying on the commercial media and the internet to monitor the actions of local officials and identify sources of discontent so that they can deal with them before they get the public uh, really mad and spark widespread unrest. They have unleashed the media to report on local environmental problems, health and safety issues, and other issues that people care intensely about and that could stimulate widespread unrest. Media rev revelations of local malfeasance also help Beijing deflect blame for those problems uh, away from themselves and onto the local officials. So local officials are very wary of those media watchdogs and they do everything they can to try to fence them out. As a result, we find that censorship is actually often tighter at the local level than it is at the national level because those local officials have the most to lose from those exposés of problems at the local level. But journalists managed to get around those news blockades by getting their colleagues from other places to report um, on problems in uh, their locality. So in other words, they cooperate with one another to leak the information. Uh, the problem that occurred in uh, Nanjing gets reported in Suzhou and vice versa. Um, and there are a number of such cases that are described in our book. Um, I wanted to, uh, I just lost my example here. I had an example that I wanted to share with you about that. But uh, one example, for example, uh, is in Shaman when there was a lot of local opposition to building of a chemical factory in Shaman. The local media in Shaman didn't report on it, but it was uh, reported by media in other localities. Interestingly, local officials have tried to prevent this kind of cooperation between journalists in order to leap over media blockades. And at one point, back in 2003, the Politburo actually banned that kind of reporting. Um, but the ban hasn't stuck, and you see a lot of that kind of reporting going on. Uh, and of course, the internet is very useful for helping people jump over those local media blockades. Competition from the commercial media further drives the official media and the government itself to become more transparent. In order to maintain its credibility, the government must release more information than it had before. So this is one of the most interesting things to me, is that when you get uh, media competition from the commercial media, and you get online media, then it's no longer possible for the official media simply not to report something. Because uh, Xinhua, CCTV, 
have absolutely no credibility if people can learn things from these other sources and yet they're simply being told the situation is fine from the official media. Uh, we saw a big breakthrough during the Sichuan earthquake in the way Xinhua reported in real time casualties from the earthquake. So reporting was just much more objective, much more fast-breaking than it had ever been before. It, uh, Xinhua also began reporting protests back in 2008, which was a huge breakthrough because previously there had been no reporting of protest activity at all. But people learned about these protests from the unofficial media and the internet. So Xinhua had to start reporting it themselves. Of course, this is a big change from the time of the SARS epidemic in 2003, when the official media suppressed news of this epidemic. Uh, because it was at the time of the meeting of the National People's Congress. They didn't want any bad news to spoil the atmosphere. And people undoubtedly died as a result of suppressing that kind of information. So in a crisis, people really care about getting accurate information. And if Xinhua, CCTV, and the government are not providing it to them, then people lose all confidence in the government. Uh, and it's clear that the Chinese government understands this because it has passed a new law that actually requires the lease of information. It has an open government information law. Now, of course, implementing the law isn't always so easy. But it's striking that transparency, the norm of transparency, is now um, uh, very much present in China. The government has embraced the norm of transparency. And you have laws that are supposed to enable people to get this kind of information during crises. You see people now using this new norm, this new law, in order to try to get information on things like government budgets. Um, and so this all stems from the commercialization of the media and the internet. And uh, we see the demand for greater transparency as a result. And of course, as the government does improve its transparency, it's helping the government itself check corruption and improve its credibility with the public. So many top politicians in China <coughs> welcome greater media and internet oversight. They recognize that it helps them solve problems before they spark mass discontent. Most positive about the uh, constructive role of the media and the internet are premiers and Jabao and before him Zhu Rengji and economic officials who have the responsibility for managing China's economy and sometimes I think about these folks as I call them the, the performance coalition. These are leaders who have an interest in having the economy perform better in order to maintain public support for Chinese Communist Party rule. Yet, there are other leaders, other parts of the, of the party and the central government, especially the Chinese Communist Party propaganda department, that um, has a kind of reflexive preference for tighter control. And what's striking to me is how the propaganda department retains its remarkable clout within the <coughs> Communist Party and the central government. Why it is still so powerful remains something of a puzzle. You know, I remember back in the early 1990s, um, 
analysts attributed the clout of the propaganda department to the fact that it was led by Ding Guang Gun, who was a good friend of Deng Xiaoping's. They play bridge together all the time, and they said, oh, of course, this is Guanxi politics. This is, you know, Deng Xiaoping's pal, it's Ding Guang Gun, and that's why the propaganda department is so strong. But Ding and Deng are long gone, and yet the propaganda department seems to grow more and more influential, along with internal security apparatus, um, and perhaps the PLA as well. Um, the marketization of the media and the growth of the internet by making the job of the propaganda police harder have justified their need, their demand for more resources, more authority. And so it may actually have enhanced their clout within the Chinese Communist Party. So these are the people that I talk about as the control coalition. So, um, you know, I'm not really sure whether or not it makes sense to think about these two views as ambivalence, that the same people feel some days they wake up and say we got to work, we got to loosen up in order to improve government performance, and other days their paranoia comes to the fore because they see what's happening in North Africa or there's something else going on in China and they say, oh no, we need to really crack down and tighten up. Or is it two different groups? It's interesting that despite the commercialization of the media and the internet, we st so much of what goes on at the very top in China remains a, block, a black box. We know so little about how decisions are made. We don't even know in what arena different decisions are made. I mean, was the decision to go all out on a, a national campaign to get people, other countries, to boycott the Nobel Peace Prize award ceremony when Liu Xiaobo was getting the Nobel Peace Prize, was that decision made by the Standing Committee? Was it made by the Politburo? Was it maybe made even by the Ministry of Public Security, which had rounded up Liu Xiaobo and thrown him in jail? Or was it made by the propaganda department or the foreign ministry? So we don't even know that. Um, but it, we do see the results of the policy process and it does show this kind of halting back and forth between encouraging the media, especially in issues like environment and food and medicine quality to serve as watchdogs and improve performance, but in other areas that are more sensitive, um, they're very tough controls over content. The Chinese Communist Party's fetish for control and the extreme political security, insecurity of its leaders try drive it to try to maintain control over information despite the impossibility of doing it completely in an internet age. Chinese netizens are the young, well-educated urbanites whose loyalty is crucial for the political stability of the regime. So, um, six months ago, I uh, was invited to a very interesting occasion called the US-China Internet Industry Conference. I had attended the conference in San Francisco the year before and as one of just a very few American academics who were there, they invited me to actually speak at uh, the 2010 meeting in Beijing. 
So this is kind of a tricky occasion because the hosts on the Chinese side are the, it's the propaganda department and all of its affiliates like the State Council Information Office, all the major web portals that have very close relations with the propaganda department and that's who the Chinese hosts are. So I had to figure out what am I going to, and then the Americans are all the IT firms, Microsoft, it, Intel, etc. And they are the co-sponsors with the propaganda authorities of this very interesting meeting. And most of the discussion at these meetings is about um, uh, online commerce, about gaming, about pornography, controls over pornography, that kind of thing. Not a lot of talk about political issues. So, um, so I gave a short talk in which I made some of the same points that I have made here about how the growth of the internet is actually improving government performance in China. And that it is strengthening popular support for the government by improving its performance, its responsiveness, its credibility. And, uh, but after making those points, I went on to say that I was worried, however, that the very visible hand of the censors, especially on the web, on the internet, could subvert public respect for the Communist Party and the government. Because when people pick up a newspaper or a magazine, they don't really know what's been censored. They can't see the stories that never made it into print. But censorship of television can be quite obvious, <coughs> as when CCTV censored President Obama's inauguration speech, cutting away when he mentioned communism, or when CCTV didn't even report on um, the fire um, that in, caused by their own fireworks display of one of their buildings back in 2009. But everybody else was, I happened to be there, People were taking photographs and videos and posting them online, but then the CCTV news uh, was reporting on the Australian fires <laughs> instead of the fire in their own building. So online TV censorship, and <clears throat> what I mostly wanted to say in this talk I gave, is that online censorship is very obvious. People see critical stories appear, and then suddenly disappear, often being followed by a flood of pro-government postings from paid supporters of the government, the Wu Maotan, you know, uh, the 50 Cent Army is called in China. These are people hired to give the impression that there's a unanimous public opinion supporting the government. So what happens is people see some kind of expose or some story, then suddenly it disappears maybe an hour or so later. And then they see all of these pro-government postings flooding on online. The subtext for this kind of very visible censorship is that the Communist Party is scared of the people as I told the propaganda officials. The young and well-educated city dwellers whose loyalty is essential for the survival of Communist Party rule can see clearly just how insecure the regime actually is. And because they have unfettered access to information unrelated to politics from throughout China and abroad, they're starting to feel entitled to have information. All information, including the information that the party thinks they shouldn't be hearing. So depending on how 
the Communist Party and the government respond to this demand for information. I think it is conceivable that the demand for information could be the rallying cry for a widespread opposition movement in China. And the slogan could be the people's right to know. So I'm going to stop there because uh, uh, my voice is petering out, but I'm happy to answer your questions. Don't be shy about that. Um, and I look forward to questions about what's happening today, about microblogs, or whatever you'd like to talk about. Thanks very much. Okay, why don't we raise hands for anyone who has questions, and please, Doug, we'll start with Doug, but introduce yourself, your name, and your uh, Doug title. Murray, formerly with the National Committee. I uh, have two questions. The first is, can you say a bit about how this debate applies to the specifically the human rights cases, the lockups of lawyers, the kind of things which don't involve mass protests, but how does opinion, public opinion play into that? The second question, which is more important, is would you object if we wish Jan a happy birthday? <laughs> Um, on treatment of political critics, um, I think the suppression of information about the uh, fate of individual political critics is pretty effective, and that most people in China don't even know who these people are. So that, for example, with Liu Xiaobo, you know, I don't think that this is this um, very unsuccessful anti Falun Gong type campaign that they launched worldwide to try to get different governments to sit out the Nobel Prize ceremony and to introduce Liu Xiaobo issues into a lot of their global diplomacy was um, not forced upon them by public opinion. This is something completely engineered at the top by, I would guess, by the folks in this control coalition who um, believed it was very important to take a tough stand. And what they did then is actually introduce people to Leo Chabois by this campaign to mobilize public opinion against him. Um, I just talked with a friend who was in China who um, said that she talked to her guide about Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei, um, the guide, only knew of Ai Weiwei as the artist who had helped design the um, uh, the bird's nest and the son of the famous writer didn't know anything else but of course my friend wanted to tell the guide all about it they actually ended up going and um, you know getting involved in some way and support activities but before this guy knew nothing about Ai Weiwei. Before hearing about it from the my the foreign visitor. Could it be they just didn't want to admit knowing? I don't think so. I don't think so. When I uh, even uh, say economic reformers in China, the critical intellectuals who are economists or speaking out they don't pay much attention to it. Journalists don't even pay much attention to it. When I talk with journalists about it, just like, you know, I ask them, they say, you know, I don't follow this stuff very closely because I know I can't write about it. Jerry. Uh, you're quite right about the control of information about Ai Weiwei case so far. 
it will get more publicity gradually, but so far domestically it's nothing. There was one Global Times thing. Yes, they so had an early story, but, but very limited information. Uh, Hong Kong Wan Pui Bao has had the most information so far. Most people in China wouldn't have access, although the internet helps. But there's been a very interesting development in Chongqing, the Li Zhuan case, yeah. the lawyer who was convicted and sentenced to 18 months. Since he's soon going to get out, they brought another prosecution against him, very similar to the first one. But publicly, they had to withdraw the indictment just recently. A huge loss of face. But do you think that was, I mean, the legal community was had organized. Absolutely. So, but it wasn't using the media and the internet very much, was it? I mean, isn't this like a professional interest group that... Yes, but they used blogging a lot, Ho Wei Fung and others. There was a whole mobilization of legal element. Uh -huh. And it's... Through Wei Wang, through their the, followers. Uh, uh, Wu Xilai and company had to publicly withdraw the indictment. It's, uh, you don't see that happen very often. And of course, that bears some uh, analysis now. We don't know what's all behind it. But it's clear the mobilization of an outraged legal community did have some impact. And that doesn't happen very often. That's encouraging. Yes. Yeah, hi, Susan. That's a great talk. I'm going to be slightly. Can concerned. you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Philo Khan. I'm with Human Rights Watch. Um, I, I'm really interested in your description of how per personalization of, of media has produced <coughs> so many more options for people. But you, you, know, you go to Beijing on a regular basis, you, a lot of the stuff that's on the stands is absolutely packed. And the stuff that has any sort of substance, those editors, particularly Kaishi, Taijing, uh, the Southern Weekend, are under a constant attack. I wonder how does that sort of fit into this paradigm in terms of, you know, that, that there is this movement and the movement is going forward in terms of more, uh, greater free expression of media? Oh. You know, uh, I think it's great that there's all that pap on the news. Uh, I'm not criticizing. I love the pap myself. <laughs> I just don't want to, I don't, we shouldn't confuse volume. Well, I mean, people might look at the newsstand in America and say the same thing. You know, I mean, how much substance is there? You know, we're reading, you know, we're reading the New York Review of Books, but, you know, it's got a pretty small circulation. <laughs> So I, you know, um, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of debate on many interesting issues in the Chinese media and the internet. And one of the interesting developments, this is, I'll just segue into the microblog phenomenon, which is pretty amazing because it's just taken off like that. And it looks like um, uh, Sino Weibo might be positioned to surpass the number of subscribers that Twitter has worldwide because it has, um, you know, maybe approaching 150 million and um, including more than half a million in Taiwan and also in uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, all Chinese language communities. And um, I've been reading lately some people who say that it's actually better than Twitter in the way it's um, in the software. It's mainly used by people on their smartphones. And um, it's enabling all sorts of individual critics in China, as well as the celebrities who are on the covers of those Pat magazines, to develop huge followings. You know, and they uh, post comments, um, many during the day, and uh, their followers are able to comment on the postings 
and so there's uh, they are being used, I, I say, in terms of collective action and mobilization, like the uh, case of mobilizing the legal community, I think the way Baugh was very, very influential. And there's another case I was reading about of um, a scholar at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences who organized a big campaign on trafficking of children and has gotten a huge amount of followers and is having a big impact with that. So I say um, it, it's become a very powerful muckraking tool. Yes. Bob Timpson, a uh, couple questions on this unleashing. Is how much in what we would call investigative reporting or analysis as opposed to just deciding what to report as hard news? are we beginning to see in the microblogs and elsewhere? And in particular, does it get to second order stuff? Why are people doing what they're doing? What's the incentive structure? That kind of stuff. Speculation about the That's question one. And, um, I'm sorry, but we've got only right. about six okay. or seven minutes and yep. lots of hands yep. up. Sorry. So yep. one question per person. So yes, there is investigative journalism, some very good investigative journalism. Yeah, uh, there's a collection that the China Media Project published in English, so if you want to read it, you can buy the book. Um, it, you see it mostly in the financial media, um, the economics of financial media. Now, they focus a lot on firms, not so much on the government. And in fact, um, uh, Hu Xu Li, who's probably the most famous journalist in China, she commented to me uh, at the time of our uh, financial crisis that she thought that American firms were much better at investigating government and not so good at investigating firms. <laughs> Whereas Chinese media is really good at investigating firms, not so much the government. Uh, so I say there, it's actually pretty impressive. They don't go after cases until they s nose around and find out that there's maybe the start of some investigation going on. Government investigation. Government investigation. In other words, they're careful. They don't necessarily break <coughs> investigative journalism stories. Um, unless they think that there's a good, well first of all they know they're right in the facts and they do a lot of, uh, you know, devote a lot of time and journalist time to do the investigation. But then they also get a smell that um, this probably will fly because there's going to be an official investigation. Uh, thank you. Mark Stallman, TMT Strategies. Uh, I'm wondering how much conversation there is about the, uh, the broader question of the impact of technology on culture. Uh, this is sort of the, the Needham dilemma uh, issue. Having invented so many things, the Chinese elite deliberately chose not to uh, incorporate them because it might actually alter their culture. Is there much discussion of how these new technologies will in fact chi change Chinese culture? Um. No, I mean, I do read journalists doing the same hand-wringing about everything's pap, everything's superficial, we really need the deeper... Yeah, that, that's that that's that's content that's analysis, though. I'm, I'm talking about technology. Well, uh, but you mean not the content. internet, primarily? Technology, yeah, cell phones, internet? Sure, and those are fine. No, I think, I mean, people have... People relish it because it is a kind of liberation. It is a chance to uh, to learn things that you could never learn before, to have discussions online about topics that were taboo topics just a decade ago. So um, I'm sure there are some Confucian scholars who think that things are going downhill, but I'd say they're a very tiny minority. Uh, to what extent is the uh, social network there or the, or the social media 
aware of what's going on in the relationship with China with North Korea and the problems with the international uh, group is having with North Korea. And, and if so, if they are aware, what is the sentiment of, of uh, that they have? Is it a supportive or not supportive of North Korea? Well, it was a very important signal when the when Beijing started allowing um, discussion of North Korea in the media and internet. For many, many years, that topic was banned. When they started allowing discussion, it looked to me like they were willing to uh, allow a more critical public opinion to develop in order to support a somewhat tougher position on North Korea. So um, basically there's very little support for North Korea in the commercial media or the internet. Uh, people are pretty frustrated by the provocative actions of Pyongyang. And so, um, but I notice that public opinion doesn't seem to be driving the Chinese policy as much in that area as it does on Japan. Hmm. Yes. Hi, uh, Nick Schwartz. Uh, I don't know. I was. You seem to be sort of derisive toward the uh, the 50 cent army and their ability, and the ability, the ability of the propaganda department to influence uh, popular opinion or guide public thought. I was just wondering, wondering do you really think that the uh, that 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 group is not as strong as it once was, or has, has lost its ability to strongly influence? No, I think the propaganda does influence public opinion, and uh, to a certain extent, especially when it plays on anti-foreign nationalist themes, it resonates with some of the spontaneous sentiment of the public. Um, when it talks about the risk of chaos, disorder, and we see a lot of that today in the reporting on North Africa, I'm sure this also resonates with people's fears of uh, internal uh, disorder in China. So I say in those few, in those domains, I think propaganda is quite effective in the defense of the party, doing everything right and stuff. I think people are pretty cynical. How important is the uh, 50 cent army in that regard? I have no idea. I have no idea. But, you know, I mentioned in the book one problem with flooding the web with paid supporters of the government, which is. If, they were, if the leadership was using online public opinion as a way of learning what people actually think, this pretty much destroys the value because they themselves won't know which positive sentiments have been paid and are phony and which ones are real. And in fact, it may cause them to discount all the, pub the positive public opinion and say, oh, well, that must have all been paid, and only pay attention to the critical public opinion as being authentic, which would be a big distortion. Okay, maybe Ron and Frank, and then we have to close. Uh, Dr. Sharp, I just wanted to add, I don't know how Ron, uh, Ron Jabbers from Ron Jabbers Worldwide. Uh, but he's a former journalist. <laughs> I used to work for Newsweek for a long time. I just wondered how many people in the United States know about the uh, $50,000 army that we get people employed here to influence opinion for products, culture, the astroturf. So, you know, the Chinese are doing we, we, we call it astroturf. Yeah, is that what you're... Well, I, you know, certainly the practice isn't unknown, but I, um, I think it's usually paid by commercial uh, exactly. uh, businesses or maybe sometimes political campaigns, but not our government. So that's a distinction. 
this, this economy is all about business, and their economy is all about government. There's about business, too. Yes. Frank Kale, USCX. In the current period, <coughs> the major issue in the area we're talking about seems to be the popular rebellions in the Arab world and how the Chinese government is reacting and so-called Jasmine walk around revolution and so on and so on. So from the two sides, from the popular side, how much is the Chinese public able to learn about facts that are unfolding in the Arab world? And then on the government side, how much are they interested in, for example, explaining why they abstain rather than voting against a no-fly zone in Bolivia? That is to say, their policy in all of this with a focus, I guess, on Libya. How much of you, well, and, and how are they getting the information? I don't know. The, uh, I, I haven't seen anything on the explaining the specific vote, so I don't have uh, information for you on that. There is a lot of reporting of what's going on in all these countries. And People's Daily and CCTV, they have foreign correspondents who are reporting um, the uh, the frame for the reporting in all of these cases is that they're all kind of the same. They're all leading to disorder, and that the West is interfering. It's. Uh, but if you want to see a very thoughtful analysis, you can read uh, the piece that uh, uh, international relations scholar Wang Ji Su wrote. I don't remember if it's in the foreign affairs article that he wrote or just in the Chinese uh, interview he did. I think it's a Global Times, maybe, in which he talked about the differences from country to country because he said, you know, we need to pay attention to the specific dynamics that vary from country to country. But generally what the public is getting is pretty uniform from country to country. And I am concerned with the anti-Western slant of all of it. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you.